Hello, everyone, and welcome to Jude Part 4. This is our conclusion, uh, and I'm so glad you guys have joined us once again. I'm hoping that you've taken a chance to pray into this session where we're going to go through God's Word together. Um, today, we're going to go through Jude 17 through 25, which is the end. Uh, and, uh, man, it's, it's pretty powerful, so I'm, I'm hoping you've prepared your hearts so we can dig right in. So here's the test. Uh, when we read the Bible, we want to make observations of particular things going on. Um, so for example, you may have noticed a phrase that was repeated a couple of times. Um, and it's a little bit hidden in our English translation, but in the Greek, these three words come uh, right in a row twice. And it's, but you beloved. Uh, I believe it's, umes de agapetu. Uh, and it just says it twice and there's like you can always use things like this to see sections um, to see sometimes where how things are broken out um, but I want you to do right now is I want you to in in verses 17 through 23 there are five commands that I want you to find this is more of a hunt and peck type of thing so just sit as a group and try to find those five commands now the one way you can determine what a, a command is is uh, imagine someone saying watch out right? There is no, there's an implied you at the beginning, beginning of, of that. It says you watch out, right? But most of the time when we do an exclamation of a command, we say watch out or, or, you know, something like fear not. Those are all commands. So take a look. There should be five of them that you find in verses 17 through 23. In this first section, the first, but you beloved, is saying, remember, remember. And, and it's about an apostolic statement about how the, in the end times these scoffers come around. And he's just completed this whole idea of all these false teachers, what they look like, what you, why you need to be careful for them, and so forth. So here, there's this idea of remembering. And to go, I want to go outside of Jude for a second. I want you to just think about any time in the Bible where there is a particular, think of an event that you are called to remember. Uh, there, there are a few of these. Some of them are much more poignant than others. Um, but as a group, just sit down and, and think through what are events that get repeated through the Bible. And I'm going to tell you, uh, don't cheat. So for example, Jude's already used the Exodus event, and we talked about that when it came uh, in like verse 5. I think it might have been our first session. So try to think of something different. If you, if you want to think about the Exodus, that's fine. Just talk about it a little bit more. But find um, an event in the Bible that has been used as a, something to remember uh, and kind of the implications of that. So these scoffers have particular ways um, of being recognized and understood. If you read uh, verse 18 and 19 together, 19 kind of clarifies and, and, and speaks about them in a further way. And then 20 brings up a whole different type of people. What I want you to do is I want you to take the description in verse 19 and the description in verse 20 and compare and contrast those. You see that there's, there's these two things that are being put right up against each other um, after it's, it's brought up this apostolic statement of the scoffers in, in, the, in the end times. So just compare the verse 19 and verse 20 uh, and see what you come up with. When you get to verses 20 and 21, it's completing a thought on that second, but you, beloved. It's, it's speaking of how they're supposed to be. You may have noticed uh, in the previous statement, there's this, this idea of, in verse 19, it is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. And there's an interesting thing that happens in Greek there. The worldly people, while we might not see it, there's uh, the Greek term... Um, could be seen as, it, it's the word used for soul or life, um, people with breath, the fact that you have, you, you are the type that breathe, right? So this idea of worldly people or like people of the breath. Um, and a, lot of a lot of times it's actually translated sensual or of the world like it is here. But then it says devoid of the spirit and that's using the word, uh, what 
Erasmians would say pneuma, uh, what uh, Koine Greek would say pneuma, and all it is is that that's, uh, if you think about it, that's the breath of the Spirit. So you have this this comparison of um, the worldly people, they, they have the life's breath, but not the, the true Spirit's breath. Uh, and you see that it moves into speaking of, of, but you, beloved. And the thing I want you to look at there, it says, keep yourselves in the love of God. And it uses some things to describe, what, like, how do you do that? How does one do that? So I want you to take a look at those words. How does he say, how does Jude say to do this? And the hint, look for words that end in I-N-G, and then kind of talk about how well are you doing at these things? Uh, what are some of the challenges you experience? How could other people help you? And that type of thing in order to uh, keep yourselves in the love of God. Previously, when you found all the commands, you found that two of the commands were show mercy. It was basically kind of a, a have mercy, show mercy type thing. Um, and, and I think that's an important concept in this whole section, the idea of mercy. It's actually mentioned three times in such a short area. It came up once before in the very beginning of the book, but this is there's three mentions of mercy here. And what I want you to do is you'll notice that um, once it's in regards to um, believers, and then in the other time, it's in regards to other people, uh, this whole idea of mercy. I want you to find the order of it, and I want you to talk about why that might be important. Uh, think of the flow of thought here of, of, of mercy and how we get it, uh, what comes first, why is the order important, um, and that'll be good enough right now. So you've talked a little bit about uh, mercy in this passage. Now I want you to consider yourself. This is one of those things I recognized a while ago. Um, I've recognized this about a lot of things in my character. It's like, you know, you're not as merciful as you think you are. Uh, and I, so I want to ask you the question. Um, is mercy a character trait that you have? Why? Why not? What does it look like? Um, is it, do you think it's the same type of biblical mercy that you might see in this passage? Just use this as a way of discussing, you know, this character trait that clearly, biblically, we should have because we've been granted it. We've been granted mercy. Therefore, go be merciful. I mean, there's one mention of us receiving mercy. And then there's these two mentions of how we can show that mercy, even in situations that are quite dark. For example, that third one where it's, it's talking about, um, the whole uh, dirty, soiled garment type situation. It's like, no, um, how is it we show mercy in those moments where maybe mercy is hard to be found? All right, so we're done with mercy now, but I want you to think about this. Pastor Isaac talked about three types of people that are described in verses 22 and 23. He kind of carved them out beautifully and showed how um, it's talking about how we interact with these three types of people. I want you to go ahead and re rename those three types of people, those of you that actually uh, sat through the sermon and you, you understood how Pastor Isaac put them. And, and I, I want you to ask, okay, what types of these people do I encounter most in life? Who is it that you rub elbows with that are of these categories? Like who are the majority of them? And then I, I just ask the question and talk about in your group, what keeps you from engaging them? Uh, and uh, I'm not going to give you any hints. You've got to remember what, what happened in the sermon, but then we'll, we'll proceed to the next question. The fact of the matter is um, we interact with a lot of people. Sometimes it's just simple people doubting. There are some people that are actually being led astray. And then there are those rattlesnake type people, the ones who you could get bit by. Um, and Jude has been pretty harsh along the way about all of these. But there is this idea of mercy that goes along um, with how he's saying, he's saying, you know, this is showing mercy. Um, there's this idea of, uh, of how as we are waiting on on the, the last things, that there's, there's this work that, that is, is, we're called to do. So what I want to do now is say, well, which type of these people were you most like when you encountered Jesus the first time? Which of those three? Uh, and why would you say that? 
And maybe you could talk about, well, what worked for you? How is it that Jesus touched your heart? What was the thing that, um, that kind of you brought, kindly, uh, kind of brought you to him? And then finally, um, how might that help you when you try to reach out to people like this? Go ahead and talk about it with your group. So we're at the end. Um, it's time for a little application. It's, it's recognizing some of the stuff we've read and how does it impact us. And I think there's not much better than uh, actually how Isaac ended the sermon. And it's, it's how Jude ends the letter and it's a doxology. It's like a, it's a rejoicing in the glory of the Lord. Um, but there's a very specific thing it says. And I, and I want us all to recognize this. It says, to him, to him who is able, to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory and great joy. The one who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you blameless. And I don't know about you, but I don't feel blameless. <laughs> I feel like I stumble a lot too. But it's talking about, this is what the doxology is for. It's this final encouragement reminding you that he's the one that can keep you. He's the one who will present you blameless in the last days. So this should be a motivating factor for us. So how I'd like to end this is with the practical questions of how is it that you actually, how can you recognize Jesus more in this way? What is it that you can do to actually look, on, look upon Jesus, his work on your behalf, and recognize him more? Or maybe it's recognizing, are, are you the one, it says that he's the one who's able to keep you from stumbling and he'll present you blameless. Maybe you're the type who feels like you have to do a lot of heavy lifting yourself. And I think we have to ask, okay, is that true? Why, why does it feel so heavy and burdensome? And then finally, what changes do you think Jude might suggest in order to make you see Jesus in the proper light, in order to maybe remove some of this, this burden. Talk about that amongst each other. Maybe help each other in, in this recognition of how glorious our king is, the fact that he would pursue us, he would die for us, be resurrected in order to provide us that way, in order to present us blameless. Because you know just as much as I do, we're not. It's his goodness. It's his blamelessness that we can count on, not our own. But he is the one through his spirit and through what he's done to enable us to like avoid stumbling. So how is it we actually do that? How is it we, we lean into him? I hope you take a moment to end this series by talking to each other about how is it Jude will remind us to do these things? And how is it we can practically, day to day, right now, maybe mid-pandemic even, how is it we see and recognize Jesus in this way? How do we help each other do that? How do we go beyond just the each others in the room to those that are outside the room and show them his goodness and how he will keep us from stumbling and present us blameless? Man, that's a huge question. It's a question we should be trying to resolve each and every day. I wanted to thank you all for joining us uh, and joining me on this. I love you uh, until we see each other again.